31 years ago, I went to China. I went to China and spent uh, the last 30 years largely living and working out of China and the rest of the world, the last 15 years of it, probably in about, uh, working in about 30 to 40 countries, which normally we call emerging markets. And uh, when I went to China 30 years ago, it was not so popular to go to China. In fact, it was so unpopular because the Berlin Wall had just fallen, the Tiananmen Square incident had just happened, and the most popular book that somebody gave me before going to China uh, was the, uh, the Ugly China Man. And uh, soon after that, another popular book was written, uh, The Coming Collapse of China. A lot of people sent me messages. Email was not very popular, but I got a few of them. So why on earth have left my cushy life going to China? I want to bring back maybe a concept that, that most Baha'is are aware of called pioneering. And pioneering in the concept, in the vernacular of the Baha'is, is to really go out of your comfort zone and to really be out there in the edge of human development, edge of building a new world order and contributing in some ways. And I think I owe a great uh, depth of gratitude to my late father for bringing us up from childhood with the thinking that we have to be pioneers in our lives. And I think maybe in some ways, it was the fulfillment of his dream that uh, got me to go to China. And I want to share with you when, when we Baha'is talk about pioneering, what it really means. It, I think it's, it's everywhere in our, in our thoughts and minds. It's about uh, really uh, being motivated by the oneness of mankind, um, being aware that there is a a dual process of disintegration and integration going on in the world. The old world order is giving its way to a new world order. That we need to be active builders of an ever advancing civilization. And that, you know, excellence in all things is, is important, service to humanity. And we need to tread the mystical path with practical feet. You all know that. When I was thinking about what are the principles of pioneering, <clears throat> maybe some of these uh, I will share with you. I think first and foremost was that you have to go there, and I read a lot of the memoirs of some pioneers, see what, what, was, what was common. Uh, one was love for the people. That you, if you go pioneering, don't go out of obligation. Go to love the people. Love your new country. The concept that you are from one country becomes kind of fades away when you go pioneering. You never assume superiority. You're never there uh, for anything but pure service to humanity. And that you learn more than you'll ever teach in your time when you're pioneering. And that you're not there to change the people. This was a very important concept. That you're there to become them and to serve with them along the path that they desire. And development you'll hear that from a lot of Baha'is, is not something to be exported. It is generated locally, and you heard Yasi talk about that, you heard many other people talk about it. So why is this at all important in a business conference? How does it even relate to, to business? When uh, Sean on the first day was uh, talking about um, Stevenson's, Brian Stevenson's four axioms, you know, uh, be, uh, be there, be proximate, change the narrative, uh, and do the hard thing, and bring hope, choose hope. I think these are the very much in resonance. I was there during that talk, and I was thinking about, yeah, the, the, they, they resonate with me. So I want to tell you a couple of stories, see how those same principles relate to uh, business, so this was uh, my first uh, few days in China, and one of the first things we did was to create a joint venture, of which I had no idea what I was doing, and the contents of the joint venture uh, in English sounded like a flowery poem, not as beautiful as the poets that, that, uh, that read their poetry today, but um, at the end of the ceremony, I realized we just inherited 400 new employees. 
And I thought that, uh, because it was in the Chinese language version, and I thought that we had been, we're gonna go bankrupt. And many people said, you've been duped. And uh, that this was taking advantage of the foreigner. In reality, if we wanted to be pioneers, we had to think of it differently. So um, I decided that, well, I don't know anything about the, the country or the language, so I'm gonna go and interview every single one of these 400 people. It took a couple of months. And I asked them to just tell me something interesting about their country, their, their culture, their life, and teach me one Chinese character. And I put the Chinese character behind me, just make sure they don't teach me a, a duplicate one. And it was amazing. The finding, the level of insight from these people who had never met a foreigner, who had never talked to a foreigner, who, uh, this was a third tier city in China. And then, little by little, something amazing started to happen. China was in the, in the throes of banking reform. The best banks in China, the Agricultural Bank of China, their entire general ledger was on a pirated copy of Lotus 123. And the finance leader, who later became the prime minister, Zhu Rongji, had said that you should all go and get technology, new technology, and uh, banks had rushed out and gotten Western technology, IBM, Unisys, NCR, you name it, Olivetti, and brought it all to China with machines that flashed and absolutely did nothing because Western technology did not fit the Chinese banking system. Through my interviews, I realized that our people knew exactly what China needed. These were third-tier city, young, uh, really mostly 20, 21, 22 year olds who spoke very little English, who tried with my little Chinglish to uh, show me uh, what the problem was, but they had deep insights. And I chose about eight of them in a small group with the idea of trying to find out what really China needs. And within seven months, we came up with a homegrown banking system that we installed the first ATM, the first multi-branch banking, the first uh, uh, fixed deposits, and we, we were in so much rush that we couldn't even name the system. We just called it integrated banking system. And IBS became the standard for Chinese banking system. Those apply, those principles apply. Fast forward that 10 years later, after having done a lot of, uh, lot of the technology and then state-owned enterprise reform, and by this time I had lived inside these state-owned enterprises, I get to a multinational corporation, uh, Honeywell, which at the time was uh, um, in great trouble. It had lost a lot of money after 911. It was amalgamation of three companies, and globally, especially in China, it was nowhere. Um, it was uh, just a few hundred million, uh, million dollars and losing money. And they asked me to come and run their business for them. And the whole idea was that when I looked at it was that we were really running it again west to east. Um, Western technology, Western domination of trying to get uh, the, uh, the business going. In fact, in one of our businesses, which is turbochargers, we had more than a hundred copycats in China. Our turbochargers were called Garrett, and then there were hundreds of them called Ferret, Tarret, Parrot, Marrot, you, you name it. And we couldn't get rid of them, like whack a -moles. And reality was that we were actually impregnating the market with that need, but that need did not satisfy. So the locals had to go and actually innovate something that looked like it. We took the same approach, and I introduced the concept called East for East. And uh, within about three years, actually, that we never had any more turbocharging competitors. We became the local company. Within about uh, four years, we became the number one country after the United States in sales. And we became the number one uh, contributor to growth. And then we took that same model and we said, does it apply to India? And we realized it absolutely does. Does it apply to Vietnam, which was the next country? We, we kind of modeled it. And we said, yeah, it absolutely does. When you think about how to really bring the best of the people, uh, the same model applies. Except maybe the colors of one is 
or the, the one meal is cooked with chopsticks and eaten with chopsticks, one is with, uh, with hands, it doesn't really matter. But the concept was the same. We, by 2015, fully 10 years into it, uh, Honeywell went from really nearly a bankrupt company, $20 billion market cap, to $160 billion, the largest industrial company in the world. And we did an aggre in aggregate, 72% of all of its growth came from emerging markets of the world. We're number one in the world. And a lot of people ask me, what was the real magic? Honestly, the real magic is no more than the one page of the pioneering that I put down here. The magic was to let the people innovate, don't give too much help, really support and respect. The story of China is already a well-known story. That was the China that I found myself in, this is the China today. And of course, there's a lot of controversy, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I can talk about the trends that's going on, but there's a lot of, I think, issues that we are dealing with today. And to me, a lot of it is deja vu. When I went to China, there was a lot more negative China out there. Look at what, what's happened. Every year I remember, would say, oh, this year China just surpassed Canada. Oh, this year China just surpassed France. This year, and that's already gotten old. A lot of people here who've lived in China, they know what I'm talking about. But I wanna actually step back. I wanna step back together with you, not back to 30 years ago, but let's step back 300 years ago. When for 2,000 years, China was the number one economy in the world, and then forget about what happened really, the, the, the circumstances that gave birth to China going down, but the Industrial Re Revolution started, and for the first time, the West woke up from the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages and started growing. If you fast forward 300 years, what we got in the world was that the 10% of the population of the world became rich, and they, there were about 600 million in the West and 100 million Japanese who were suppliers of the West. And then 90% of the world were relatively poor. And we somehow arbitrarily also said, this is first world, we skipped the second world, and the rest is third world. I know it's a little harsh, but I think it's very close to reality that in 300 years, we essentially gave birth to 10% of the population who was rich and 90% who was very poor. And if, a, if an alien visited the planet Earth, our report card would not be that great as humanity. Except in the 1980s, early 80s, 300 years into this, um, China said, I'm not, and, and we tried to export this model a lot of places, it never worked. Uh, outside of the West. But in 1980s, China said, we're not gonna follow that. We're gonna follow our own path. And they did that. In the 1800s, 1700s, 1800s, if you stopped somebody in the streets of Belfast and said, do you know that there is an industrial revolution going on? They definitely wouldn't know what you're talking about because it took about 100 years to double standard of living. It would be three, four generations. China did that for 1.3 billion people in less than 10 years, four times. Uh, Denise was living in China, she knows what I'm talking about. When you walked in the streets and you've asked people, do you know that there is a revolution? Yes, because either them or their parents went hungry. We have some Chinese people here who would testify to that. It was one, it's one of the greatest human endeavor that's ever taken place. In fact, China single-handedly was responsible for more than 70% of all poverty alleviation in the world in the past 30 years. And of course you can say, you know, there's issues of environment and labor and this and that, but when you look at what, where we got to in 300 years, largely through colonization, slavery, and all the other things that you know better than I do, that we would say, ain't so bad that we got nearly a billion people out, similar to the past 300 years, largely not through colonization and slavery in the same way as the rest of the world. So it's worth thinking, what does this mean in the context of the global megatrends that is happening around the world? Trends such as urbanization. Most of the people in the world that are now urbanizing, China, was, was the first. Aging population, you know, robotics that, that, that is coming, AI, uh, new energy that we need to uh, figure out, uh, climate change, the, the rise of the middle class. 
I want to talk about these uh, a little bit in cybersecurity and food security, everything that, that, that's uh, upon us. One of the big trends that's happening now because of the rise of China is the rise of what we call mass mid-segment in the world. People that are coming out of abject poverty into basic living and they're actually consumers. There's still one-tenth of the um, purchasing power of the West but they're still consumers and their lifestyles are now coming up into, uh, you know, beyond just basic subsistence. China has about 41% in middle, upper middle class and there's another 30%. When we talk about 30%, that's 400 million people. That's the population of US++. India has actually 60% of that emerging in the next few years. And look at Indonesia, Pakistan, Nigeria. The next three to five billion people that are actually not part of the global economy are now emerging as the engines of growth for the world. In some ways, that um, you, you'll see that a very large portion of the population of the middle class in the world, 95% of the emerging new middle class in the world are going to come from countries that we call them emerging countries. In fact, I think they are already emerged. They have already emerged, except we, d where we don't see them in that way. In fact, much of them from China, from India, from Africa, and we haven't yet seen the incredible amount of innovation, the incredible amount of contribution to arts, to science, to human experience that these people and these societies are gonna bring to, to the world. Andre was very c kind to call my, my presentation Global Trends and Traps. Um, I was thinking of calling it the Great Scam, but uh, you know, he, was, he was much better at the choice of words. But I think this whole thing should give us pause to think. There's a lot of traffic that comes our way, especially now. Uh, whether through media, through governments, through vernacular that talks about the great decoupling again, that the rise of China is our demise, that our model is ideal for the world order, and following various trends and headline news, not just about China, but about really what's going on to humanity. And I think my experience in China tells me that it's just the beginning of humanity realizing that there is a new chapter in opening prosperity to all of huma humankind. That we should, more than demonizing one little practice of either China or India or Middle East or this or that, celebrate the fact that for the first time in our modern day history, in past 300 years, we have the possibility of actually engaging people that are not the same as the West, people that will contribute equally to human prosperity. I think a trap-free future or a scam-free future is that to realize that China is just the beginning. It, just, it was just an example, it was just a door that paved the way for the rest of humanity to really become participants in the affairs of mankind. India, the rest of Asia, Africa, Latin America, in fact, we have in the immediate future, and somebody said, I think it was Siamak, who said, please also talk about the youth. If I, I wish I was 18 years old today. Not for the vain reasons, but that I could participate one more time. The, the time that I participated in the growth of China, I felt like in the 30 years, I lived 100 years of experience. But if you are a youth today, you, can, you have the opportunity to participate in, in probably the greatest melodrama of human history that's going to happen in seeing the rest of humanity rise to really have a big impact on the fortunes of mankind. And I think I'd like to just uh, finish my comments by saying that to invite everyone of us to be really pioneers of oneness of humanity. And uh, I finish with these words of Baha'u'llah that we must be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age you live in. 
and center your deliberations on his exigencies and requirements. Thank you. Think of sharing what you know.